Good afternoon, good morning, or good night, wherever you are. I'm really happy to share some of the progress we've made with, with Wildlife Insights uh, as a new platform to not only maximize the use of camera trap data, but uh, maximize the use of any other passive sensor data for conservation. Uh, let, me let me start with a story, a little bit of my story. I, I was trained as a field biologist in Colombia many years ago. Uh, and I spent a lot of time, my first project was looking at uh, spider monkeys. I spent a lot of time in the field looking for spider monkeys in, in the upper Amazon basin. And as many of you know, you know, these are difficult places to work with. This is a picture from 1987, so a while ago, with a colleague working in these places that, you know, where camps were just created, et cetera. And I spent a lot of time looking for these animals, you know, we're very elusive spider monkeys up in the trees. Uh, there were no digital cameras back then, so these are, these are uh, uh, some of the few pictures that I could take. But one of the things that I realized when looking for spider monkeys is, is that there's a lot of other animals in the forest. And one day I was walking around and I saw, to me what looked like a dog. It was a little dog, there was a few of them. They had small, Kind of ears and, and a small snout and a very small stout kind of uh, tail and, and legs and I, I could see them for like a, about 30 seconds so I did this drawing or something like that in my something similar to this in my field um, notebook and I went back to camp and I relayed this story to other people in the camp that, that had been working for a longer time there and they just looked at me like I was crazy. They said, no, we've never seen anything like that here. We spent a lot of time here. I think you saw some domestic dogs. I was not sure, I was sure they were not domestic dogs. So fast forward 30 years or so, and I'm working at Conservation International and, and I'm leading this program uh, where we have a biodiversity monitoring network using camera traps across a number of sites in the tropics. And we're looking at some camera trap pictures from Peru, from Yana Chagachimillen, one of our sites there in the foothills of the Andes. And I see this picture, which is of a couple of bush dogs. And I instantly remember this time when I was in the field. And I wish I could like still respond to these people. Like, see, I, I, I knew I saw something. These are bush dogs, as you all know. Um, they're very wide ranging to Central America and South America, but they're very rare. So about, a hun about out of a 700,000 images that we had for South America at that point, uh, bush dogs only showed up in about 260. So no wonder any, nobody believed me back then. And, but, but this is the beauty of camera traps. You know, they provide undeniable proof of something that is there. And not only that, but it's, you know, there's a date and there's a timestamp and there's a clear image of an animal. And that is so, so powerful for anybody doing conservation. And so, I mean, I wanna to connect to the big challenge here, which is we are all trying to save uh, species and habitats, but particularly for species, we have still have these problems. You know, we don't know how many species there are, where they are, why they're changing. And so the answer to this question for me and for many of my colleagues is that we need data. We need data that is more reliable, more current, data that is verifiable. We need to be able to derive insights from that data quickly. It's not enough to have a lot of data. You cannot figure out what the data is telling you. Um, it's not gonna help. And then the other challenge is that this is not something that can, one person can do or one organization can do. This, is, this data have to be collected by multiple organizations, individuals around the globe. And so camera traps are an amazing tool. And this is a paper we did a few years ago, a couple of years ago, where we just did like an overview of where are the camera traps in the world. And we discovered quickly that there's thousands of projects, you know, millions of images, just, just counting the ones we know. Um, and this is, when you look at people buying camera traps, this is a market that is going up. Um, this is, these are some projections that we got from, from doing some research. But on blue, you can see that the number of camera traps in the thousands is going up. 
we didn't expect it up of you know people buying close to two million camera traps by 2025. The number of images is also going up, which are these yellow bars. You know, we're accumulating an enormous amount of images, billions of images, and and people are spending a lot of money on these. You know, there's by 2025, we expect to have spent about $458 million in camera traps. And this is all super great, but we're not taking, I don't think we're taking enough advantage of this investment. Uh, and this is the reason. There's major, major barriers that we have right now to be able to use, analyze, and understand this data. The first is the slow data flow. Anybody who's an ecologist uh, knows that, you know, this is, there's a lot of data that needs to go through and be looked at, and that's just a big problem for many people. They don't have the patience, they don't have the time, or they don't have the resources to do it. It takes months to look at a camera trap data set, and then it, took, it can take years to publish something out of it. The second barrier is that the data, even though there's a lot of data, it's all isolated, it's all siloed. It's sitting on people's computers, it's sitting in a raw form, it's not available to others. Um, and then the third one is that, you know, you really need to have a special training in statistics to be able to analyze this data. It's not, you know, there's a lot of spatial and temporal or correlation and camera trap data. It, it requires a special methods of handling and, and, it's, uh, and it's quite technical. So we don't have the tools, even if you have your data, even if you have it someplace and you want to share it, you don't have tools to gain insights from it. It's not going to be useful. So we thought, and when I say we, I mean a bunch of organizations and partners that we've been working with over the last 10 years, we thought, you know, we need better things to attack these barriers. We need software that is not incrementally better, it's 10 times better uh, <coughs> organizing the data, using AI to speed up the identification of images um, and making this, much, this process much quicker. We need a modern platform. Now we, it's the era of the cloud and everything is in the cloud and it's much easier to share when things are in the cloud. So we need a modern platform with standard security um, uh, specifications that where we can manage and share this data, where people can decide how they share it, you know, what's the license they can use, et cetera. Uh, and then last, we need data-driven insights. We need tools that can quickly look at this data and provide some insights at the local level in, and even at, at other levels, but mostly for people on the ground to understand what's happening in the places where they're working. And then we can sure aggregate this up to the global level, but I think local action is usually quicker and, and, and drives up a lot of conservation solutions. So this is the, this is the birth of wildlife insights. And, uh, and Wildlife Insights is a partnership. I work at Conservation International and Conservation International is the organization that is basically coordinating the, the partnership. But there's all these organizations between us. We have more than you know, 75 years of experience working with camera traps and analyzing data that is messy. And Google is, is a very important partner here. We're uh, providing a lot of information for us, a lot of technical support and also development of products, uh, AI models and other things. So it's a key component. So let me tell you what the key features of Wildlife Insights are, and then I'm gonna launch into a demo to show you a little bit more. So there's four important features of Wildlife Insights. We have the Wildlife Insights artificial intelligence model, which I'll talk in a minute. We have collaboration and sharing tools. We have improved uh, the data input process so that it's easy to collaborate and to, uh, it's easy to submit images to Wildlife Insights. And we're working very hard to make sure that we can provide at least basic analytics that can be extracted from the camera traps. So the AI model, you know, we launched Wildlife Insights back in October and we did the first version of our AI model. It can do an automatic ID of about 614 species that are camera trapped, um, including mammals and birds. It was trained with about 8.7 million images and is really good at identifying blanks. Uh, also, it's really good at identifying about 100 of the common species. So it really gets the common species between 80% and 98%. And anybody who has done camera trap data work knows that 
you know, you don't want to keep identifying those pacas or those very common species that keep showing up. Uh, if a model can help you do that, you can focus on the weird and rare species, which are not very common. We're working on, on making sure we can put bounding boxes in, in the detectors that we're using and also leveraging the, sec the sequential information because a lot of camera traffic data is taken in sequences um, and the model can, can take advantage of that. Um, and then also we're doing geofencing so that uh, it limits the number of species available to, to the species that you would likely find in that, in that place. Um, now the data input process, we have two or uh, we have a few ways to get data up into wildlife insights. There's a web-based interface that I'll show you in a minute where you can basically take images from your memory card, <clears throat> put it in your computer, and then start uploading. Um, you can create projects and other things to uh, organize this data. Um, there is a management system for images so that you can easily filter images by species, uh, by whether they're blank or not, uh, um, sp uh, images that have been highlighted in some way, et cetera. Um, there's also data, if you have a lot of data that you already worked on and is identified, you could contribute this data to Wildlife Insights on the back end. And so we have an upload batch process. So all those projects that have camera trap data where the images have been identified can also contribute it to Wildlife Insights, but to a different process in the back end. If you already have a database, you could contribute that database through an API as well. And we're working on a desktop solution, which is uh, basically wild ID many of you probably used it or heard of it but we're trying to make wild ID the uh, connect with wildlife insights in a, in a much more easy way so if you don't have internet connectivity you can still work on on your on your data uh, offline and then sync it on uh, when you have uh, connectivity with your wildlife insights projects then we have a bunch of collaboration sharing tools and at this for me these are the most interesting ones because you can have these multiple collaboration spaces that we call initiatives. And what they do is you can discover data around you and you can say, well, let's do a project on the Jaguars of, you know, Colombia, Peru, and Venezuela. So you look at all the data, you can search for the data. You can invite these projects and create like an, an Uber project called the Jaguars of Colombia, Peru, and Venezuela. And uh, it creates a unique website for you. It's not, uh, it's, a, it's a different URL than Wildlife Insights. You can share images, you can share data there. And you can also like uh, produce, like right away you have all the data in one place, you can download it and then do collaborations of different ways. Um, we also have a public discover page that shows all the projects. I'll show the, all this in a minute. Uh, we're, very, we're very conscious of the problems of sharing data for endangered species. So for um, endangered species, which means species that are critically endangered, endangered, or vulnerable, we don't show the locations of the camera traps where they've been captured uh, at all. Uh, we don't share images of people, although, I mean, what, what I mean by that is we don't put, we don't share them publicly on our platform, but uh, projects can look at them and, and do whatever they want with them. And then we have a, 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 a Creative Commons uh, approach for, for uh, sharing data. So we use uh, Creative Common standard Creative Commons licenses for, that are separate for images and uh, metadata. So what I mean by metadata is all the information associated with an image, like the time, the date, the species, who collected it, the location. Uh, and then for the images, it's a different license. Um, so the user can select uh, the, res the restrictions they want for, for the data and their images separately. We allow embargo periods. So if you're working on a project and you want to publish it because you're a PhD student, you can embargo your data for at least 48 months. And you know, it's, ne it's negotiable to keep going, but, um, but that's a possibility. You can, you can download the data from your own project with, with or without images, and you can also download all the public data. This function is not available yet, but it will be available soon. And also when people download your data, uh, there will be an uh, automatic attribution to your project through DOIs. So whoever's using the data has to cite your data set and you will also get, all the data users will get an email uh, saying who is using their data or, or when it's downloaded and for what purposes. And then finally, the, the insights. Uh, we have several uh, modalities of insights uh, going from very basic project level statistics 
to more activity and basic population uh, analytics, uh, community-wide analytics, including you know, species richness and the wildlife picture index. Um, and then also the, we will have the functionality to include contrast in the analysis. So if you have, you put camera traps in two different, in two or three different places where you have different land use types or activities, you can, all the analytics will be split based on those contrasts. We're working very hard with the Map of Life group in Yale University to produce uh, some more spatially explicit products from camera trap data. And, in, and ideally in the, in the future, what we'll do is the camera trap data will be incorporated into EBVs and other products. Um, and I'll show some of the initial analyses we've done on how camera trap data can augment the biodiversity products that we have currently. And one thing that everybody has asked us is to do, be able to do automatic reports. So every time you get a data set, a new data set in your project, you can generate a report, compare it with your, you know, your previous year or previous samples, um, and be able to do that very quickly. So let me you do a demo. Uh, my, my demo is linked through uh, YouTube. So I'm gonna change my screen. Miguel, please confirm if, if this works. Okay. Yeah, we can okay. see your browser now. Can you see my browser? Okay. Yep. Okay, so here's a demo. It's about 10 minutes. Uh, and I'm going to go through it uh, real quick. But the idea is that um, we want to make it very easy to use Wildlife Insights. You know, create projects, upload images, identify, analyze. It's basically these four things. So in create, you can create projects, you can create these initiatives that I was just talking about, and you can also create institutions. Then you upload your images through the front end. Um, you review those images uh, in different ways, and then finally you have some anal analytics produced for, for the project. So projects are the basic units of Wildlife Insights. Each, each project is a deployment of camera traps in a place with specific methods. And you can create a project very easily. You select an organization, you can add it to an initiative you want, you can give it a name. You know, we're, we're naming this project the Jaguar Monitoring Project, it's in Belize. Um, you can select the start date of the project, not necessarily an end date. And here you can select the license. So this is the metadata license, those are the available options. And here's the photo license, and these are the available options. The photos, we wanna be a little bit more restrictive uh, on them if, if you want to. And then you can fill in some more information about the project. You know, what is it about? What is the methodology? Uh, what is the credit line you would like to be, uh, that like, you would like people to use when they use your data? And whether you want embargoes. There's a few more options on using data that is embargoed, that is down there by clicking that box. And then you can say, well, this is, is this multiple species or an individual species? Well, this is an individual species project uh, do you have individual animals? Yes. And what's your layout? So all these are project level uh, options. If the camera traps are clustered or not, if you're using detection or things, if you have blank images, and if you use baits, if whether it's stratified or not, and other, um, and multiple other options. You can delete photos of humans or you can disable the analysis tab if you want. So once you have a project, you can start uploading images to that project. And that is very easy. Um, you just go, you don't even need to be in the project, but you just go to the upload button and you select images. And these are some test images for demonstration purposes. Um, and you are gonna create a new deployment, so a new camera, um, and then the start and end date of that camera. Uh, we'll probably likely automate this in the future, but that's how it is now. And then you start uploading. And as the images upload, which will upload as quickly as your internet connection is, uh, they're being identified uh, right away by the AI model. So once the images are up there, they're gonna be identified. Then you can go to the identify tab. And here you can filter the data in different ways. You can clump the, the images in bursts so that you can look at images that are in sequences and do those things. Here are the filters. You know, you have a couple of cameras there. Uh, you can search for a particular species if you want. Uh, you can also look at blanks, not blanks, and other types of images 
and we're improving these filters a little bit better. These are all also look for highlighted images, which are images you want to show off. You should also group by bursts. So these are bursts that are separated at least less than five seconds. So here's one burst of one image of a giant anteater. The model identified it with a confidence of about 99%. You can use common names when you look at, when you're um, working on the project or scientific names. And you can also use multiple languages. We have Spanish, English, and Portuguese for now. And you can accept this, this is correct. Uh, here's a jaguar, like one of the focal species. And again, you can highlight this one if you want so that it's publicly available. Um, and then you can download it later if you want, and then you accept that suggestion. Uh, here's a, here's a, an, a, a case where the model did not result, did not give a result. The model said, oh, this is kind of weird. I don't know if there's anything in there or not. I think it's a blank, but maybe not. So uh, when, you, when that happens, you can mark all these images as blank uh, very easily, and then they're moved to the next plan. Here's, here's an interesting one where the model is saying there's a red brocket in here, and the image is kind of dark, but the, we have these tools that you can uh, improve the brightness and the contrast of the image. You can see on the left side there, there's a brocket or, the, or the, something that looks like, yeah, right, you can see it better now. Um, so the model like helps you really um, many times in, in, in processing these. Once all your images have been cataloged or like looked at, then you can look at the, you explore some analytics. Here are the analytics that we would show uh, if you are doing um, um, community analyses. So if you have several years of data, you can look at changes in, in diversity, you can look at the trends, uh, of the slopes of the trends of different species. Uh, here we have also put a species richness product, which is very basic now, but shows you like how many species are shown in each camera trap. And then you can look at the dynamics of different species, um, um, selecting the menu, a menu of species, and you can look at individual occupancies of those species. You can also look at detection rates, which is a measure of how often a species shows up in a camera trap uh, and look at changes in detection rates. And finally, we can do also activity, which is sometimes is a good thing to have, especially when there's pressures on wildlife, a lot of species will shift their habits. Now, let me talk about initiatives. And these are the projects where you combine multiple projects. Um, and they provide a flexibility of collaboration. And this is all driven by the users. We don't interfere. Here's an initiative we created for Team, a project that I used to work on uh, for many years. Now all the team data is in Wildlife Insights. And these are all the statistics of the team data with how many species, where identifications by type, the most common species, the most, the most, uh, the winning camera traps. In the details tab, you can specify uh, all the components of a website for this initiative. So you can select logos, the name of the initiative, you can select contact emails, you can put cover images, you can even include um, YouTube videos, uh, links, and uh, text of different types. You can select like your best images and drag them there. Uh, you can display a map with the locations of the camera traps if you want to. Um, and also you can put content, other content like the logos of all their partners that are contributed data. So this will take a long time for somebody to develop. It will be expensive, but you can do it in Wildlife Insights like with a click, basically. And let's see the result, resulting website. Um, that's how it would look. It would have the logo of team. It doesn't have the logo of Wildlife Insights. There's a video of team, some text explaining what team is doing, um, the logos of the partners and then all your images that you want to show off and also the locations of the deployments of team. These numbers are the number of deployments in different areas. So they're not the number of cameras they're the number of times cameras have been put in different places. So that's, a, that's an initiative. Um, and I think that's going to be very, very key to, to increase the way we, we collaborate and work together with camera trap data. Now let me talk about the explore page. Um, this, if you go to wildlifeinsights.org and click on explore, you can immediately see a map of available projects. 
Uh, as I said, we just started, so we don't have not accumulated a lot of projects yet. We have about 60 projects and 4.5 million images, but that is quickly growing. You can click on a project. Um, let's uh, explore some projects in Africa. For example, there's a very um, interesting one in Virunga Massif. And here's all the stats and the images that have been shared by the project owner. Um, you can look at some some statistics um, and also the organization name. It's not shown here, but um, now we have that capability. And you can see the images as well. Some of the images, not all of them. Um, but you can filter images by species or by, by country and explore other projects and know what other people are doing. And then that will help you collaborate. For example, if I want to know who's working on wildlife, white-lived peccaries in South America, here's all the projects that have shown wildlife peccaries. Um, and let's say I'm only interested in the ones in Peru, then I can narrow that down even further. And then there's one project in Peru. Um, and uh, those are the number of images and the number of cameras and the number of deployments made for that particular project. Uh, uh, you can also download all the data that is public uh, and we will have that available soon. So you can learn more at wildlifeinsights.org dive into the details. Uh, we have um, uh, the pages available in Spanish, English, and Portuguese. We have videos up there. We have um, all kinds of information and also a very, very important learning center that we started to put together on how to do all these different things. So um, I'm almost done. Uh, let me just go back to my presentation here. So one thing I wanted to touch upon is, uh, before I stop is uh, I wanted to talk about how this information will improve on existing biodiversity information. This is work that has been done with Yale University, uh, Dr. Ruth Oliver, who is a postdoc at um, Yale University Map of Life Group. Um, so one thing is that camera trap data can be extremely useful in increasing the spatial coverage for certain countries and certain species. And here's, here's um, uh, a couple of examples. On the left, you can see a couple of countries where we're comparing the number of the spatial coverage of mammals. Uh, and you can see that for those countries, there's more camera trap data and wildlife insights. There's more coverage of camera trap data than there is from GBIF. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the right side, is, um, is looking, we're looking at species, in particular mammals, and in particular some species. And again, there's a few instances, and this is not a comprehensive analysis yet, but there's a few instances for mammals and for birds where there's more information on camera trap data uh, or more spatial coverage for camera trap data than there is for, for GBIF. So if, you, if we articulate that data with GBIF data, um, then you know, we have a much more comprehensive picture of changes and distribution of species. Uh, we can also improve the temporal coverage. And on the left side, we're looking at wildlife insights data for the Stiker, um, which is kind of a Congo Basin. And uh, you can see that in many different countries, there's more camera trap data over time than GBIF data on the right. So, um, so again, you know, camera trap data has the potential to fill in many gaps, in particular for species that are not representative in the GBIF database uh, in the tropics and, and habitats uh, or for rare species that are seldom observed. So this is like the vision for us, you know, have a much more comprehensive understanding of changes in species abundance and distributions, where camera trap data can be one more data set. But also, not only that, but really empower people at the local level who are using camera trap data to understand their data, manage their data, and make sure we have uh, outcomes based on data and not on, on hint on, on, uh, on hunches. Um, so I just want to thank, uh, I mean, there's an enormous amount of people that are working on this project. Uh, and here's all of them, ranging from lawyers, technologists, biologists, um, journalists, all kinds of people. Um, and um, I, I call them the herd. Um, they're much more, they're a very cool herd. And I also want to um, uh, acknowledge our supporters, um, the, Moore, the Moore Foundation, the Lila Hill Foundation and Google. And with that, I'm, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions that, that you might have. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you, Jorge. It was a fantastic presentation. I think I, I learned a lot. Um, now we will go ahead with the questions and, and answers uh, section. If someone wants to ask a question, just raise your hand and I can unmute you, or we can go with the uh, typed questions. The first one will wildlife insights interface will, with public engagement platforms um, such as Sue Uni, Universe to allow broader volunteer involvement in coding images. That's one question from Cathy Remini. Yes, that's a very good question. And yes, we do have plans. We're actually already working with Zoo Universe so that if you have a project where you want to engage a number of people, citizen scientists, you could create a Zoo Universe project inside your Wildlife Insights project. Mm -hmm. And that Zoo Universe project will go into Zoo Universe and you will basically be able to share the images from Wildlife Insights into Zoo Universe. Uh, that's a very important question because a lot of people really like doing this and, and enjoy going through images, but it's also an important way to ensure the quality of the data and also um, make sure that we can use the data for training better versions of the, of the AI model. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've been exploring um, two platforms, Zoo Universe and iNaturalist. Uh, in my opinion, Zoo Universe is a better fit uh, because um, there's already a lot of camera trapping projects in Zoo Universe. Uh, iNaturalist um, would be probably more suited for rare species or for particular species that are not common. Um, but anyway, we're exploring both of those. Okay, excellent. Now, question from Andrew Little. How well do these uh, artificial intelligence models work with North American wildlife species such as fox, pheasant, uh, white-tailed deer, and others? Uh, so a lot of the data was trained with North American species um, and, and it's working okay. I would not say it's perfect yet. The model sometimes confuses the white tailed deer with mule deer or other species, uh, but it's getting there. Um, you can start using it with um, North American species, but it's not going to be super comprehensive. We're still um, working to, to incorporate some of the eMAML data that is, eMAML is another platform using camera trap data, mostly in North America, Panama, and some in Africa. And eMAML is, is a partner of Wildlife Insights. So some of the eMAML data will be shared with Wildlife Insights initially. And we're hoping that when we do that, that will substantially improve the model in North America. Okay. One, another question, um, it's how storage of the data uh, is paid for? How long will storage be provided? Are all data public or can data be kept private within the project? So we're contemplating a number of different um, sustainability models for wildlife insights. One of them includes uh, having organizations from certain countries or from, or companies, for example, that collect a lot of camera trap data pay a subscription. Uh, I think that for small projects and for small organizations and for countries where they cannot really afford to pay for storage, uh, we're not going to, or we're, we're, we're envisioning not making the, the service free or waiving, or, or waiving payment. Um, but for other places where there's a lot of data and a lot of resources, um, I think it's important for the sustainability of the platform to cover, not only cover storage costs, which actually are not very high but coverage the support of the platform, the development of new models, new features, and, and maintenance, which is very expensive. Hmm. Thank you. Um, and I don't know if there was another part of that question that I think I did not answer. Sure. Um, let me, um, are, the, all, are, all, are all data public or can data, keep, uh, data keep, be kept private? That was the second part of the question. Yes, so the, so the, so if you share the data um, as, uh, publicly, the data will be public except for the species that are um, uh, endangered, critically endangered or vulnerable. You can add more species to that if you have national red lists that sometimes don't include uh, you know, the ones in IUCN. Um, but you can have also embargoed data and that is an option depending on the situation. You know, in some places, for example, 
where there's a lot of wildlife trafficking, you might not want to show the images from that place because that would encourage poachers to come or for some other reason. Or there's a regulation at the national level that does not allow you to display images of wildlife publicly. Uh, for those cases, we're, we're happy to, to, store, to still store the data but, and still use it for uh, global de development of global indicators and other indicators that can you know, fuzz the data so it's not, it, it cannot be, you cannot trace it back to the origin. Thank you. Have you yeah. given any thought to Facebook groups as a source for images? Uh, I think Facebook is a great tool to share images of people and social situations and, you know, share like your highlighted images. So yeah, we have a Facebook page, actually. We have also uh, an Instagram page and a Twitter account. Um, and all these are ways where we can, you know, we can share images from the platform or users can share their highlighted images. Uh, it's a different purpose of for us, it's um, a different purpose to kind of socialize the information, but sure, we, we're big into social media. Okay, no, but I, I guess the question was more about using um, pictures that are uh, posted in Facebook as a source for your, for your um, algorithms. Maybe I'm, I'm misinterpreting the questions, but I think that was the, the, the question. Okay, yeah, so that's different, yes. Um, I don't think so. Um, I mean, the, the reason we don't, we're not looking at that is because camera trap data uh, provide presence, but also provide absence information because of the replicated nature of how camera trap data work. So a camera trap, you know, camera trap is taking pictures of animals, but also allows you to calculate the absences, which is not apparent with, uh, you know, um, data that's only showing an image of an animal. So uh, iNaturalist, for example, is also a presence uh, platform and so does eBird. Um, so Facebook would just be like another kind of presence platform. And what we want to do is we want to capture the full story of, of the camera trap deployment, which would not be easy to do in Facebook. I mean, you could try to upload, you know, 50,000 images of your camera traps in Facebook and see what happens. But I wouldn't, recommend, I wouldn't recommend it. I think it's, it's a different purpose. And it's the nature of the, of the data that makes it a little different. And I guess you can also, the, the metrics that you're trying to get out of this uh, um, um, camera trap system are more subtle than just, just presence. Um, uh, uh, you want to get deeper into the guts of perhaps species population abundance trends over time. Is that uh, a fair uh, representation of what you're trying to achieve? Yes, that's, yeah, that's right. Um, and in order to be able to calculate abundance or occupancy of species, you need the absences and you need the detection probability, which is not provided if you only have presence data. Amazing. Another question from Robert Hagen. Um, we began trying to use camera traps in 2015 and quickly learned that data management was the barrier to doing anything with the results. So we're ready to begin processing imaging sets from an ongoing ex exclosure experiment. How can we, or can we uh, get started now? I think this is, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm also asking, how can I go ahead and start? If I have uh, any camera trap model or brand, can I just dump my images into this system? Uh, so yes and no. So I just want to um, make very clear that we are still in a test in testing. Our platform is a beta. Uh, we have already a few testers uh, working and improving things. Um, if you want to become a tester, there's a wait list. So uh, let us know if you do if you want to do that. The first step is to create an account in Wildlife Insights, and also send me an email uh, to or send an email to info at wildlifeinsights.org saying that you want to become a tester. And, and that way we can enable your account. Um, I, think it's, I think it would be great to have more testers. We are trying to you know, uh, get, get rid of the main bugs in the platform right now and, and figuring that out. Hopefully in the summer, we will be able to make a bigger, um, we'll be able to give out more accounts for people. And yes, anybody can open an account if you have a camera trap in your backyard and that's all you want to do, you can open an account for free, get it in there when, when the testing period is over and get your images in there. 
Um, so there's no limitation on the, the from one to you know infinity number of camera traps. Excellent. One one aspect that you are covering with this project is the processing of the imagery and it's you know after the the, the camera trap network has been producing the images. What about what about uh, the, the the other aspect, which is uh, before? And one of the issues I've been reading on a couple of papers preparing for this webinar was that you have a lot of the, that one of the biggest issues with setting a camera trap network is um, engaging the local community, say so they don't uh, go destroying the camera network that you are putting. Do you have any uh, experiences or advice that you could share with us about this aspect? Yes, I mean, we have the organizations that created Wildlife Insights have, you know, a combined experience of 75 plus years of doing camera trapping. So we have a lot of experiences around working with communities and others to do that. We haven't put any of that yet in our website, but that's a, that's a very important point. Uh, and I think that's something that we should do. There's a number of very good camera trapping protocols uh, out there. But I think you're right. I think there's a big gap in how do you make sure that, you know, you are working with a community that understands what you're doing so they, they don't vandalize your camera traps. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge. It was, it was a fantastic webinar. And uh, thank you for all the participants and the questions. Um, we will make this uh, webinar uh, available online um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a couple of days. Um, any final comments uh, from your side, Jorge? No, thank you, Miguel, again, for the invitation and, and whoever is listening, you know, if you have more questions or more details, you can email info at wildlifeinsights.org. And, you know, I hope that, that this is a tool that uh, will be important for many of you. And, uh, and, and keep, keep your eyes on, on, on our news. We're, we have a, a bunch of new things happening. In, uh, in April, we're going to do a month of camera trapping in Colombia. The whole country of Colombia is going to deploy about a thousand camera traps for 20 days, and then we're gonna have a big event around that. We're also gonna be at WCC, the World Conservation Congress in France, if you wanna learn more and have some more demonstrations and announcements there. So um, let us know what your needs are, um, visit the website, and, and I'm happy to, to keep the conversation going. Excellent, thank you, Jorge. Thank you, and to all, to all the participants in the webinar, have a great weekend. Thank you, Jorge, again. Thank you.